Okay, before we walk you through a sample set of calculations, let's do a quick review of what we did. Once more, we showed you how to read the burette properly and how to set up your reaction flask with a piece of paper underneath so you can visualize the change. We also went through how to prepare your sample. We said you're going to get a sample from the stock room. You're going to tear a flask, measure about a gram of this substance, KHP. Don't forget, KHP is not a formula. It's an acronym, an abbreviation. And we're going to record the uh, number of grams to four decimal places, add about 50 milliliters of distilled water, dissolve it by swirling if we need to warm it over a Bunsen burner. We'll do that, and then we will bring it back to room temperature and add a few drops of the indicator phenolphthalein. Remember that phenolphthalein turns pink in the presence of base. So we're going to look for the initial change to pink, which tells us that at that point, the acid is pretty much almost completely neutralized. Remember that in order to do the experiment, we also had to condition or prepare the burette by closing it. Uh, the burette uh, valve or stopcock at about 5 to 10 milliliters of our KOH solution, which is our titrant, to the burette. Notice that in this experiment, the titrant is the KOH, which in this case is the unknown solution, the one that we don't know the concentration of. We'll tilt the burette to an almost horizontal position and rotate it so that the liquid rinses the interior. We get rid of any residual water from the wash of the burette. We'll repeat it maybe a couple times, and then we'll put it back on the clamp, open it, and make sure that there are no trap bubbles and that the liquid flows smoothly. Uh, we'll refill the burette with KOH and drain it just to get the meniscus back to 0.00 milliliters, making sure there's no uh, air bubbles trapped, especially, especially in the tip of the burette. Uh, we typically give the outside of the burette a little wipe down just to make sure we didn't accidentally spill some of the KOH on the outside, which could affect our readings. To perform the titration, we take the initial volume on the burette, uh, and then while swirling the flask with one hand, we open the burette valve slightly to get a dropwise flow of the KOH. Uh, as the reaction proceeds, we're going to start observing swirls of pink color, which kind of fade back out. And when those pink swirls persist for about three to five seconds, we stop adding KOH. We close the valve. We rinse the interior of the flask with distilled water. This is to make sure that uh, any KOH that didn't make it to the bottom of the flask that got stuck on the walls of the flask can get rinsed in. And now we're going to continue the titration using those rapid 180 degree turns of the valve so that we add KOH in small, tiny micro drops, checking the color after each addition. <coughs> as soon as we see a very faint pink color that persists for at least 20 seconds, that is going to indicate that we have reached the endpoint. And we will then read the final volume, again, to two decimal places uh, of precision. And now what we'll do is we don't refill the burette. We use this as our new initial volume. And then we repeat the procedure with a second sample of our KHP standard. Um, as I try to show on the uh, demo, but perhaps didn't come out as clearly, this is what the uh, color change looks like. Notice that in this experiment, they're using sodium hydroxide and is being added to a dilute HCl solution. When they reach stoichiometric proportions, in other words, near the equivalence point, the phenolphthalein indicator changes to pink, and we call that the endpoint. Again, very important that we catch this very, very early in the change of the indicator. In other words, we don't want it to go to a neon pink color, because that means that we have overstepped the... Uh, equivalence point. A student of mine made these pictures for me, and you can see here three different sample titrations. The one on the left, not good. That's too, too bright a pink. The one in the middle is you know so-so. The one on the right is a very, very pale, 
kind of change in color is beautiful. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk you through a sample set of calculations. Uh, we're going to know, because we know the number of grams of KHP and its molar mass, how many moles of KHP are in the flask. Remember, we don't care about the molarity of the acid in the flask. We care about how many moles are in there. Uh, we're going to find out how many moles of KOH were required uh, to titrate those moles of KHP on a one-to-one -one stoichiometric ratio. And since we know what was the final volume in the burette minus the initial one, we can calculate how many milliliters of KOH were delivered, dividing the moles of KOH by the volume of KOH converted to liters. That gives us the molarity of KOH. And our goal is to find two good samples, in other words, two titrations that were not overshot, that had the light uh, pale pink color. If you do overshoot uh, one of your samples, then ask the stockroom to give you another little bit of KHP so you can do another trial. But we're going to limit the number of trials to three, maximum of three. You should be able to get two good ones in there. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and go and look at a sample set of calculations. And then uh, that will conclude our presentation here. Don't forget that after the uh, procedure is done, you will be emptying the buret back into the storage bottle. We're not going to throw it away. Rinse the buret with tap water, then distilled water. And as I showed in the video, we need to test the tip of the buret against red or pink litmus paper and make sure that it doesn't change to blue. All right, we'll return the burette, dispose of the waste chemicals, and uh, again, unless you are instructed otherwise, most of these chemicals can be poured down the drain. Uh, just make sure that you flush them down with plenty of tap water. All right, thank you very much, and let's look at a sample calculations set. Okay, students, let's go through a sample set of data and uh, walk you through some of the calculations you'll be doing for this experiment. And as usual, I'm going to use some data collected by a former student of mine. And here it is. This is from former student Bruce. Very smart kid and uh, went on to study, I believe, physics or something like that. Uh, the thing we remember about him is that uh, he, he had a problem with getting angry. I mean, there was one time I remember he got so angry that his skin almost turned green. It's amazing. But anyway, this is a typical <clears throat> data set that you have here. And there are two trials in here. Notice that the only data that is presented in the beginning is the data collected. The initial volume on the burette and the final volume on the burette. And as I've instructed in the past, data that you collect in the lab as direct measurements is called primary data and we record it in ink. Uh, if you make a mistake like he did here in the second trial, you don't erase it, you don't blot it out, you just cross it out and write the correct number afterwards. Uh, we have here the grams of KHP for each trial. And the one thing we want to do is you always want to show your calculations on a separate piece of paper. And this need to be well organized. And we're going to do these in pencil so that if we make mistakes, we can erase them. So here is our calculations. When you have multiple trials, you're only required to show, excuse me, to show the calculations for just one trial. And it is assumed that the other set of calculations will be uh, kind of a repeat, just with slightly different numbers. One thing that I do sometimes is to uh, be able to follow these calculations is to number the rows here. So we're going to number these. Let me pull this out to the side a little bit so we can show the numbers. So we're going to call this uh, 1 here. And this is going to be number 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Let's zoom out a little bit. 7 and 8. And that way we can track the calculations in our calculations page. 
So the first set of calculations we're going to do is, well, what is the volume of KOH delivered? And this is item number three over here. So we're going to say this is the volume of KOH. And we obtain that by subtracting the final minus the initial. So item two minus item one, which in this case is 11.35 minus zero. Don't forget the two decimal places. And that means that our final result should have two decimal places. Be careful not to assume that you can uh, eliminate that zero in the second decimal place because that is a significant figure. So we have 11.35 milliliters. So we're going to come back here to our data sheet and write that down. Notice that I'm writing this one in pencil because if I had made mistakes, I can erase them because these are just calculations, so it's secondary data. And although we're not going to show the calculation, we can see that this one's going to be 11.10 over here for the second trial. Okay, our next calculation is we have the grams of KHP, and as we said, we're interested in how many moles of KHP were titrated. So this is going to be item number five. It's going to be the next one here on our list. And we're going to calculate here what are the number of moles of KHP. Don't forget KHP is just an acronym. It's an abbreviation, not a formula. Potassium hydrogen phthalate. And that's going to be the mass, which was item number four. Right? Divided by the molar mass of the compound. Or another way of saying it is you want to use a full on dimensional analysis is we have 1.1002 grams and we know that one mole of KHP is 204.22 grams. We were given that uh, in our lab manual. The grams cancel out, and let's see what that is. I'm going to use our calculator here. So we have 1.1002 grams divided by 204.22, and that gives me 5.38732739 times 10 to the minus 3. Now we have five sig figs here, we have five six figs there. So we need to round this, right? We need to round it to five sig figs. So this will be 5.3873. The next digit is a two, as you can see. So that means that we keep the value here, and that's times 10 to the minus three moles. Okay, so let's get this out of here and let's bring this over to the other page and let's write it down here. 5.3873 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Since the units are already indicated over here on the title uh, columns, titles column, we don't need to repeat the units that way. We don't have to cram too many symbols inside these uh, cell bo in the, or boxes of the table. Uh, we're not going to show the calculation, but if we were to do it, this other one would have been 5.4941 times 10 to the negative 3. Okay? Okay. Our next step now is to say, well, um, how many moles of KOH did my titrant deliver? And that's a simple stoichiometric issue. So this is going to be item number six. Okay. Let me pull this over to the side a little bit more. There you go. Oh, you know what? I did that too far, too high. See how you can erase here is keep it, things here, keep it uh, fairly uh, visible and easy to read. So how many moles of KOH did we have? Well, remember, we said that uh, KHP is a monoprotic acid. In other words, uh, it delivers one unit of hydrogen ions per mole of substance.
So KOH has, again, one hydroxide ion per uh, formula unit. So that means that we have a one-to-one -one ratio. So that means that if we had 5.3873 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of KHP, according to the equation, you get 1 mole of KOH for every mole of acid, which in this case is the KHP, okay? And that is 5.3873 times 10 to the minus 3. Those moles of KHP cancel out, and you are left with moles of KOH, okay? So that is the number. We're going to copy over here. We're back to here to item number 6 in our data sheet. So this is 5.3873 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of KOH. And in the other trial, it would have been 5.4941 times 10 to the minus 3. We don't need to show those calculations. Okay, this is it. We are down to where we want to go. We want to find out what is the actual molarity of our KOH. Let me pull this up a little bit here so we have a little more visibility. Molarity of the KOH. So let's go here to our calculations page. This is going to be item number seven. This is going to be the molarity of KOH. Now remember, molarity is moles per liter. We know how many moles of KOH we delivered, and we know what volume it was delivered in, right? But of course, we need to adjust that for the uh, milliliters to liters conversion. So essentially, this would be item number six, which is the number of moles, divided by item number three, the number of milliliters, but we had to convert this to liters, and there's, you know, 10 to the negative third liters in one milliliter, right? That is our conversion. So let me roll this a little bit to the side here so we can have better visibility, and we're going to put the numbers here. So we have 5.3873 times 10 to the minus 3 moles, and we have 11... 0.35 milliliters, which we're going to change into liters, minus 3 liters per 1 milliliter, so that the milliliters will cancel out, and we're going to have moles per liter in the end. Now, okay, let me uh, make some room here before we go to the next step. Excellent. Okay, remember that uh, I had already calculated the uh, numbers of moles here. And I left it in the calculator deliberately. I don't need to rewrite it again. I already rounded it before, but uh, usually when we do multiple sets of calculations, we round at the end. So I left it in there. So what I'm going to do now is take the number of moles divided by milliliters, 11.35, right? And since I'm dividing here by 10 to the minus 3, that is the same as multiplying times 1,000. So I'm going to take that result multiply by a thousand and I get 0 0.47465 etc etc now remember in these numbers here the number of milliliters has four sig figs that means that my final result needs to be rounded to four sig figs so I'm going to keep the 0 0.474 and since the next one would be four six five right but i had to round it here that means it has to be rounded up so that means that when i enter that piece of data in my uh, data sheet i need to round it up so let's see what that's going to be i'm going to come back here to our uh, table and i'm going to round this as 0 0.4747 molar and if I had done the same calculations with this other one here, I would have obtained 0 0.4950 molar. 
Okay, now for my last step, I want to calculate what is the molarity of this. Now at this point, before I go on, I want to make sure that uh, I'm going to have a percent difference here. So before I calculate this, I had to make sure that I didn't, I shouldn't have done a third trial. Now, if I had been doing this experiment in the lab, what would have happened is I would have discarded a trial if I had obtained, you know, that neon pink endpoint that I told you guys to avoid. I would have discarded that automatically. But every now and then, you know, you may have missed something. Typically, it doesn't happen, so I'm feeling good here. But just in case, let's go ahead and calculate what is the average molarity of these two trials. And be careful, we have a grayed out area here in the middle. And we're going to put it over here in this box. So let's go back to our calculation sheet and let's calculate the average molarity. Let's put this piece of paper in there. Okay, here we go. Let's go ahead and calculate what is the average of the two trials. So remember, that would be essentially the sum of the two divided by the number of uh, items, right? So that would be 0 0.4747 plus, we said the other one was uh, 0 0.4950 divided by 2. So let's do that calculation here. Okay, I have this guy here. Uh, let's go ahead and go ahead and do it. 0.4747 plus 0 0.4950 divided by 2 is 0 0.4845. But remember, these items, when you add them up, they have, you know, four decimals. This number here is a to total number of items, so it has no bearing on the numbers of sig figs. So the operation in the top is a sum, which means you should have four decimal places. So we're going to round this to, you know, four decimals in there. So when I report this on my data sheet, this will have to be over here, zero point four eight four nine molar this is the average molarity gotta do one more thing even though it is not uh, required of us but we have to show that these two trials are within five percent of each other right so let's go ahead and move this a little bit here and let's calculate what was the percent difference here. In an average titration experiment using the instruments that we use, there is a built-in 5% error. So in other words, any result we get is going to have a built-in 5% error. So as long as our data here gives us a result where the two trials are within 5% of each other, we're okay. We are under that threshold of error of the experiment overall. So remember the formula. You take the absolute value of the difference between value 1 minus value 2, and we divide that by the average, and we multiply that times 100%. Okay, so in this case, we had absolute value of 0 0.4747 minus 0 0.4950. We do absolute value because we're really not concerned as to whether it's, you know, plus or minus uh, error above the average. Oops, sorry, I was going to write the word average again. We already calculated that, right? We said it was 0 0.4850. Four nine times a hundred percent. So let's see what that is going to be. Let me uh, pull this paper up a little bit here so you can see it. So I have uh, 0 0.4747 
minus 0 0.4950. Again, that gives me a negative value, but I am going to use the absolute value of that, and I'm going to divide that. Notice that this result to four decimal places gives us one, two, three sig figs. Oops, sorry. I didn't show it to you. Okay, so this is the difference between the two values. Notice that respecting the uh, rules of sig figs for a uh, subtraction, we have four decimal places, but it only gives us three sig figs. When we divide this by the average, which is 0.4849, we get this number, and now we're going to multiply times 100. Now remember, because the difference on the top of that fraction gave us three sig figs, we now have to round this final value to three sig figs. So 4.186 and so forth, 4.186. I'm sorry, that's not where the bar goes. I'm going to put the bar on top of the last significant digit. So this is 4.186. 1.9%. In other words, this is okay. It is less than 5%, and so that's my result. In the lab, what we would do now is we, go, we would go back to our little storage bottle of KOH. Let me uh, bring this down a little bit here. And what we would do now is we would go take our bottle, and we would take... Uh, a label or a marker and write down the correct uh, titrated concentration for this KOH. It's no longer approximately 0 0.5 molar. It is now 0 0.4849 molar. Remember, you are saving that bottle with the residual KOH for another experiment we're going to do later in the semester. Okay? I hope that helps. And so what you'll do now is you will gather your unknown and you will process the data for your unknown and arrive at the uh, final molarity of that KOH unknown, again, to four decimal places. Thank you.